it was something that came up from one of our two previous sessions. If you're with us for those, thank you for coming back. It's a bit of fun. But someone said a lot of the challenges about how we connect upwards, how we communicate to C-suite or our bosses, and some of the tips and techniques we'll share today, it's not just about communicating upwards, it's about communicating sideways and downwards, sideways to colleagues, perhaps downwards to teams. So some of these techniques may be useful for that too. But I'm gonna look specifically at some of those perhaps little tips and techniques that will help you connect with your boss. Now, something I said uh, on LinkedIn, I did a little film on LinkedIn earlier and said, look, if we think, right, it's communicating with my boss, this is not if you happen to be in the corporate world. Yes, it is, because that's really important, but also in other worlds too. So if you're a freelancer, we communicate with our bosses. I've been freelancer most of my life. We communicate with our bosses because our bosses are our clients. Our bosses are the people that will make a difference to our lives by um, employing us. So some of the techniques may be useful just to think slightly differently. There's no, uh, as I've probably shared with you before, in my coaching approach, I don't tell anybody what to do because no one likes being told what to do. True. There's another sideways look at what's happening with this lockdown at the moment. Yeah. Tension builds because we tend to tell people what to do and whatever, uh, whatever. So I won't tell anybody what to do. All I'll ever do is suggest some ideas and then say, try them out. See if they work for you. And if in a week's time or so you're thinking, oh, that was an idea we talked about on that little Zoom thing. Let me try it out. I'd be absolutely delighted. And I'd love to hear from you how perhaps maybe it's changed slightly or maybe you're working slightly differently. Because that's what it's all about, isn't it? Because in this particular world that we live in at the moment, will it be ever be business as usual? This was something we talked about a little earlier about. Are we going to go back to how it always was? Will we have the back-to-back -back meetings? Will we have the jobs that don't really add value to an organization? Will we just do what we've always done because we've always done it? My own personal thought on that is no. Things are going to change, guys. And if they're going to change, can we be ahead of that particular curve? Because now is the opportunity to think about it. Not when, uh, as Mr. Trump said, it will finish in two weeks' time. By the way, apologies to my friends from the States. Um, I've been watching Donald Trump. It's the gift that keeps on giving for the last few weeks online. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness me. Uh, and what will happen next? Um, however, I don't think he's right in that it will all be finished and done in two weeks' time. I spoke to a friend of mine who hopefully will be online with us, Kate, this morning, who's a very clever lady based in London. and she was saying she probably thinks there's going to be a year's worth of this in one form or another. And I don't think any of us will say, right, in a couple of weeks' time or a month's time, let's go back to normal. It's as it was. So what I'm loving this is all you guys have said, right, let's, let's chat about this and think about this and perhaps be optimistic about what we can do within our skill set, what we can do within our mind to lift our bar. Because now is the time to do that. Because I don't know about you, but I've spent the last few weeks thinking about stuff. Whereas normally we don't get time to think about it. We just do it and we carry on and get on the windmill. Fiona's smiling because she recognizes it. You know, getting on the windmill, yeah, on, on, the, on the hamster wheel and not getting off it. We don't have time to get stop and think. Hey guys, we've got time to stop and think. And stop and think about us. I want to ask a question about that a little later on. However, um, if things aren't going to be the same as they always have been, how are they going to change? So here's my question for you, my first question. What do you want your outcome to look like? Bearing in mind we think the world might be changing in what it does and how it does it, what's your outcome going to look like? When all this is over, do you want to go back and be reactive and wait for them to come to you and wait for them to look at you, especially with our sort of semi-topic for today, which is influencing and persuading our bosses? Will you wait till they spot you? Because how many people get spotted like that? Not many. Yeah. What tends to happen is that um, you do something which stands out, which gets your boss's attention, which means you can then sort of build and capitalize on that. And that's something we'd be talking about today. How do we get their attention? How do we deliver something that, they, that stops them and makes them think, wow, they're cool. They're good. I need to keep my eye on where they're going and how they're going to do it.
And it's the same with clients. If we're freelance, if we're doing things like, how do we persuade and influence our clients to spot us as opposed to all the other people they can choose from? So perhaps some of the things we'll talk about today will help that. Um, the one thing I would say straight away is, and I've said it before, and you may have been bored silly with me saying it in sessions, in coaching sessions or online, please be outcome focused. Think of the outcome. Don't be reactive, be proactive and think what is the outcome I'm after and how clearly do I know what that outcome is. Now, I'm going to tweak this slightly because we say, well, I want to get promoted. I want to get lots and lots of money. I want to sell more than anybody else. Fine. Yep. They're strong outcomes. But what do you want your reputation to be like? What I'll say a little later about authenticity. You want to come across as authentic. You want sustainable, not instant win. Because this instant win you might do in this month or in the next two months will then start all over again. For all the lovely people online in sales, that's exactly what happens, isn't it? Yeah, the sales finishes the cycle, you sell, you do really well, and it starts all over again. And then you have to do it. And like most organizations, not in the current climate, they'll probably put the barrier up a little bit more, the targets up a little more. Anybody ever been used to that? Do they put targets down on a regular basis to make it easy for you to get? Uh, no, Sarah's shaking her head like that and she's very good at selling. Uh, but same thing, yeah, so it's all gonna change. So having the big world, the, the holistic look at it, saying, what do I want my outcome to be? I don't think it's the specifics of, I wanna hit this target this month or this target next month. What do I want people to say about me? And, and I think it was Jeff Bezos, uh, who runs Amazon, came up with a great quote, which said, your reputation is what people say about you when you leave the room. And it's so true, isn't it? All our reputations are the one thing we want to build and be the best they can possibly be. Now, is that something that happens reactively? If you're lucky, yes. Uh, the rest of us have to work hard at it. I don't know many people that have built a reputation without working at it whatsoever, apart from the wrong sort of reputation. And I promise not to mention Donald Trump again. But that reputation you want to build, you want to grow. So if I can help you do that in our little time together, I'd be delighted to do that. So how do we influence people? The first mistake that most people make, and I'm sure various people on this call who do similar things to me would agree, is they don't think from their audience's point of view. They think from their own point of view. Yeah, Mez is nodding his head there. He's worked with hundreds of audiences all over the world. It's true. People don't think from their audience. They think, I want to tell them this. And how does that, how does that work in certain ways? Let me give you an example. I wonder how many times bosses, and a lot of your bosses, have seen people come to you with a proposal or an idea. And what they're really saying is, look at me, look at me. I'm great. I can do this stuff. Aren't I brilliant? which is not really what the boss wants to hear. They want to hear something that will make their life better. But if we ignore it, we just say, hey, look at me, I'm doing this, aren't I? And we wait for people to give us all that congratulations, whereas the boss might be in a slightly different place. And that's one of the ideas from today, of being the audience. Again, for the people I've coached and the people I've worked with, I have six principles. Hopefully you've got a little card for those, but I'm looking at faces, see if that little card is handy. One of the people nodding away, great, thanks, Danny. Uh, is it in your wallet? Could I test? Not at the moment. It's not in my wallet. It's, uh, it's in my top drawer. It works. All right. And how far away from work are you? <laughs> um, Sorry. I, Daddy, I tease. I tease. But it is one of those things that the first principle I always use is be the audience. Get inside the audience. It's my second principle is what's in it for them. Because, guys, that's what your boss or your employer or whatever is always looking for. Let's be really honest, sounds mercenary, but it's totally true. And for those of you who are bosses, you're looking exactly the same thing. Mike, you look for the same thing in the people who are working for you, don't you? What's in it for you that will help you be better at your, your job, that'll help the business succeed and everything else. So that's what they're looking for. So be in the audience. So come to them with solutions, not problems. Be radiators, not drainers. There's nothing worse than an organization than having a drainer who is there constantly chipping away about why things aren't working. And we've all, in fact, give us a nod or a thumbs up if you recognize colleagues and friends and people who are that sort of person. Who knows a radiator? Who knows a drainer? We all do. 
loads of people who radiation drainers radiators those people who come towards you and think oh look it is great drainers people who come towards you and you think oh no not again so what does your boss want do they want someone who'll come to them with great ideas or someone said you know they haven't fixed this they haven't done that and blame yeah you know anybody who blames everybody else i'm gonna blame them oh no it's not my fault it's their fault and blame cultures are not healthy it's not fun working in a blame culture so if you sometimes find you think oh it's it's fault i can't talk to anybody or it's hr's fault they haven't done this think again yeah people will always blame but does that make you more attractive does that help your reputation to grow or does it chip away at that reputation that you want to work hard to preserve and enhance so being the audience is the first part of that next thing is as part of being the audience um who is it you want to try and influence how much you know about them what's your leader like now i'm going to be very careful on this because i could upset people which i don't want to do uh i think there are probably two sorts of people if we're really generalizing there's a sort of person or boss let me just put it in phrase. the boss who is the processor facts figures they want powerpoint they want detail you know the template police sort of if anybody recognizes that in the corporate world the template police sort of thing everything has to be facts figures numbers there's that sort of boss and then there's the creative boss who wants the big picture who wants the emotional connection who wants to really get it they want the great stories now what have i learned from the years of been kind of doing this is that you have to understand who that person you're trying to influence is what their normality is because if they are a, a facts and figures type person i i it sounds dismissive i don't mean it that way but they like process and they're processor type people if you go to them with the hey look at this great creative idea um it's not going to jar with them because that's not their normality yeah it's not the sort of thing they will chime with if you go to the creative person and say how about we do this where the audience will be or they'll suddenly oh yeah i get that so maybe think about tailoring your message to fit the person like being the audience to fit the person you want it to connect with the most now i've just generalized in two areas the processing type boss or the creative type boss if you know which one they are it helps you formulate your message towards them and i want to give you some tips today about perhaps how you can work with both of them to make a real real difference so something i'd like to do now which is um something we played with before and uh, it was I, there's a couple of people waiting to come in sorry tony and claire in the states hopefully join us so hopefully tony and claire you're with us now thank you for Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to start a poll, if I may. Let me come back to vision for you. Hello. There we go. Uh, I'm going to give a poll, if I may, and um, ask you, are you all ready for this? Yeah, there's a little bit of, little bit of thought on a, on a Wednesday afternoon. Okay. Um, there we are. I'll launch it. Can you see that? Now, can I say straight away, guys, this is anonymous you don't have to put your name with this because i'm not going to use it as blackmail at a later date but i just thought it'd be fun to say right leadership style right how would you describe your leaders not your leadership your leaders style how many guys have a little look at that? I'll let you go at that for a little while. Strategic. Oh, well, and it's sound. Yeah. There we go. Everybody's sorted on that. They've all got a bit of a go. Are we all okay? You got that, Tony? Give us a wave. Thank you. Right. Okay. Let me just check in terms of anybody still waiting to come in. Okay, I'll end the polling on that. Interesting. I, a bit of everything in that. That's really interesting. I would have loved to have um, found out uh, 
which which ones were which on that um because the ones who yeah okay I, what, let me shall i reveal it sorry i should share this with you right let me share the results on that one can you see that give me a thumbs up if you can quite interesting isn't it so nine percent said their boss is democratic 22 percent said their boss is autocratic all right um head in the sand i dread to think who that is uh, strategic yeah it's pretty good 53 percent the winning one on that transformational i like transactional is more in your process world again coaching style love the coaching style perhaps um dylan i mean we talking in terms of your boss i've got to be very careful he might be online uh, which which style would you no, I, that'd be wrong of me, wouldn't it, to attribute? Because I know one or two people have someone that is on their line management that I know quite well, and they've, I want, don't want to attribute that to that. I can see him smiling. Uh, but yeah, but I think he might be on the line as well, so, which is good. So, um, thank you for that. Really interesting. Strategic is good. So we've got a lot of people um, who are in the strategic world, uh, and how do we influence and persuade them right any questions you have by the way the question little chat screen is there stick them in ask me anything you like as we go through i'm delighted and happy to answer any of those as we go through and if i don't answer them as we go through i'll happily do it afterwards as well so um and i'll come back to you on that so if you've got any specific question you can either send it to me or everybody if you can send it to everybody then we can share that question too okay so let me share my screen again and go into the next little bit of this. So I've sent it over to you. There we are. Sharing that. Okay, now. Can you see over to you guys? This technology is, there we are. Can you see the connection journey? Give me a thumb. No, you can't. Oh, that's interesting. Technology I'm, I'm loving and getting used to even more. All right, now. I'm going to share the screen again and try that and share. How's that? Better? Yeah. You go on. Lovely. Thank you, guys. Yeah. This is the other interesting thing. I don't know whether something we talked about before, and quite a lot of people, quite a lot of you, work in front of audiences. And we thrive on having that little instant feedback buzz, don't we? And when we're online like this, it's much harder. If you're one to one, it's easy because the mics are open all the time and, and there's not a problem and we can, we, can, we can hear it. But if you are um, with quite a lot of people uh, and in different parts of the world, it's much, much harder to try and make that instant connection. So forgive me if I say that, it's just to get feedback. So I, I know what you're seeing because I can't see it. Although I have written it a little earlier. So. If we think about things as connecting journeys, it means we don't think about the specific bit that we're looking at. It looks the much bigger picture. So we see the whole picture rather than just the, the, the little bit we tend to look at. Back to that example I used earlier, someone goes in the boss and said, have you got this great idea how we could change this little bit and it would change the world? And the boss is thinking, actually, that's not gonna change the world on the big side. So let's have the whole journey and think about it like that. So, what would I say? Five things on my connecting journey. First one, start with their outcome in mind. What is their outcome? Not what's our outcome. It's important to try and get our outcome, but we'll only achieve that if we understand what their outcome is. What's the pressure they're under? How will they be perceived? How will their brand be built or their reputation be built? How can you enhance that? So start with their outcome in mind. And can I give you an example of this? Anybody do, um, in the old world, when we had meetings and we met with people and talked to them and hugged them and did not namaste or whatever we do now, um, anybody do pre-reads, right? So they submit a pre-read to uh, the C-suite or to an executive or whatever. Uh, and Mezzi's just nodding because we have a lot of experience. We had a lovely conversation about that. Mike's the same thing. They give you pre-reads, right? And often on PowerPoint. And they give you a load of pre-reads on a PowerPoint and send the file. And then we hope they read it all. Often we build the pre-read because we think about all the things we want to tell them. We bung it in the pre-read and chuck it at them. Our job is done. And then if you think about it realistically, 
how many of them actually take any notice of it? How many of them actually uh, just get it and put it in and then open it just as the meeting starts? Because they haven't really looked at it much. And why haven't they looked at it much? Because if you've got a file of 50 PowerPoint slides with loads of bullet points, I, re I repeat what we said in our last session, bullets only kill. That's the only thing they're good at. Uh, and we never remember them. Yeah. But imagine you are the boss. You receive the pre-read PowerPoint slide with 50 slides with lots of bullet points in it. Are you inclined with everything else that's going on to really pay attention and really go for that? Or are you more likely to kind of think, I'll get round to it at some stage, or I'll wait to the meeting and I'll kind of, I won't say bluff it, I'll just keep going as I go through, because that can happen. So let me give you a little technique. Now I'm just looking to see on the, um, Ba, 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 ba. Bear with me. I wonder if Peter's there. If not, no worries. Um, I'm going to sh tell, share a story uh, which kind of sums it up. And I thought, what a great way of looking at it. So, anybody recognize quick, quick virtual prize of a, a trip to the shop? Uh, for anybody who can tell me whose armor that is. Henry Hates. Well done. Who said that? Oh, well done, Jake. Henry VIII's armor. That is actually Henry VIII's real set of armor. And the story I, I, I would like to share with you, and, and Peter, who was um, the museum director at the time, I was on the board of the Royal Armouries. We had three, four museums. We had the Royal Armouries in Leeds, big headquarters. We had Fort Nelson on the south coast and the White Tower and the Tower of London. And this is in the White Tower and the Tower of London. And we had a fantastic curated exhibition about Henry VIII's armor. And Henry VIII, and, and for those of you who may have heard the story before, you've seen this before, you're into history. Henry VIII had armor made like a, a suit of clothes they would in Savile Row. That's how they made armor. It's not a sort of adjustable. You couldn't have elastic bands at the back to bring it in or zips anywhere. They had to be exactly made for them. And over the years, and Henry VIII, from when he was a small boy with his first set of armor to his older end, which is one of these, when he was slightly big and portly, every set of armor was set out in this exhibition. It was stunning. We got it from all over the world. The interesting thing about it, the cod piece, for anybody who's followed history, um, actually grew as he got older, for some reason. I, I think that comes under the it pays to advertise moment. Uh, but that was this thing that, that kind of changed. However, the thing that we did was we watched the tourists. And quick wave if you beat the Tower of London yeah the white tower as tourists walked through the tower we watched what they did uh, i say we as the museum and if peter was here he'd tell the same story um he's now at the james uh, jamestown museum in the us um so hopefully he'll be on the call shortly anyway so they came in so you'd get all these tourists walking through the tower of london and some of them would come in and say oh look it's henry the eighth's father and they'd move on They've done, they've ticked the box. Then you get some who'd come and say, oh, look, it's Henry VIII's armor. And look how, and did you realize that when he was young, he was like the David Beckham of his day, which is true. He was a very fine athlete. We don't think of it. We think of the elder syphilitic old guy with too many wives. Well, he hasn't got many left, but you know what he did. But when he was young, he was the David Beckham of his day. So he jousted and he was an athlete. So the armor worked with that. So that's the second sort of person that would go through. Then the third sort of person would come in and say, oh, look, it's Henry VIII's armor. Have you seen those rivets on the side, how they were fixed? All this kind of they really get into detail. Now, nothing to do with armor and Henry VIII, but quite a lot of bosses that I've met over the years are exactly like that. Yeah, and I call them the divers, the swimmers, and the paddlers. So you get the paddlers. Oh, look, it's Henry VIII's armor. Move on. The swimmers, oh, look, it's Henry VIII's armor. Did you know he was a young jousting person in his young days? And the divers, oh, look at that information. That's who made the armor. But that's exactly true in your organization, I'm going to guess. What you have to try and decide is which one of those are they? Are they the sort of person who would read a pre-read of 50 pages of lots of bullet points? Or are they likely to read the first page? If they're the first page readers, you got a paddler. So what, how can you help them? Maybe 
give them and they're probably going to be you know we said before about the creatives they're probably going to be the more creative sort of person because they don't want the detail they want the creative they want the ideas give me they, i call it the rennie zelberg effect had you at hello so do it if we're trying to impress them what can we do on that first a4 sheet of paper or that first powerpoint that they get it straight away then for your swimmers, they want a bit more detail. So maybe think of the first two or three pages as important to them. And as long as they've got all the detail in the first two or three pages, they've got it. That's all they need. And then for your own sake, and for if anybody, because people will say, um, when I put in these things, I make sure everything is there because I don't want to pick anything wrong with me. Well, if you think, what do they want from it? Very few people will want every single detail, every single little nugget of the information but you think if i don't put that in there i might be picked out as getting something wrong am i right yeah so what you need to do is for the detail lovers put the bit at the back so divers swimmers paddlers just a slightly different way of looking at it again to influence and persuade so there is henry the eighth and his divers swimmers paddlers next thing i would suggest on these five connection journey stops put suggestions in their context. Now that might seem strange, put it in context for them as far as you understand their world. They're more likely to accept it if they understand it quickly and it's something that's relevant to them. If it's not relevant to them, because we presume that all leaders know what we do inside and out. Why should they? If a leader had to know everything, let me ask Mike, Mike Pennington, in your organization, do you know everything that's going on throughout your organization at every minute? <laughs> I'd like to do, but absolutely no, not at all. It's interesting listening to you on the presentation is that, um, you know, we do assume that everybody will know um, what mm -hmm. we're going to present and what we're on about, but definitely not. Yeah. We all, uh, and, we all and, start from nothing. And down the years, Mike, how many people have been working for you? Oh, anything between 600 um, yeah. and maybe 1,200, 1,100 yeah. people probably. Yeah. And if 1,200 people came to you and gave you chapter and verse and every single detail, is that what you would want as a boss? No, not at no. all. And it's interesting listening about the, uh, the presentation when you were on about uh, people sending the presentations in. We've all fallen into that trap and um, nobody asks any questions and nobody actually reads it. And actually in mm -hmm. a worse situation when you turn up for the presentation on the day. And, we, and we've all done that. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for your honesty. Appreciate that. Thank you, Mike. Uh, so... Put suggestions in their context. How will my suggestion be useful for them? How will it add value to them? Rather than let me show you what I can do. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm reiterating it, but it's important. We've seen it so many times. How can I add value to them? How will you think? And let me give you a slightly sideways example of this. When someone goes for a job, the tradition is, I'm not suggesting, by the way, anybody go for another job, because I know a lot of your bosses, and that would be really difficult of me to suggest that. Uh, however, yeah, when someone goes for a job, the tendency is to say, I've done this, I've done that, I've done the other. It's standard. For those of you who interview people, you'll recognize this, right? Until the person comes in and says, I understand you've got a challenge in your organization with X. Well, what I've done at Y could actually make X much easier for you. Which one goes to the top of the list? Instantly, they do. And we can all do that if we lift our bar slightly. So put suggestions in their context will be my next communication journey uh, suggestion now please and i think we may have done this last time please all put your hands like that yeah which is okay because there's no one around and no one knows it go on that's it okay dylan everybody is doing that right i should take a mr swanton just put your hands there we are thank you very much and carol hang on i've got a full screen of you uh, full screen of connection here i can't see you john oh hang on then let me unshare right okay oh, i'll try it again yeah. All right, yeah. so let's everybody, all right, put your hands like that. Go on, Tony, you can do it too. All right, everybody put your hands like that. That is what we tend to see. That is our field of vision if we are not careful. And that stays as our field of vision, right? So, and that is where they tend to sort of how we see it. They, I'm saying they generalizing, because their world is thinking strategically, tend to look at the bigger picture all the time. That's their job. We need to understand that more. And if there's anything that gets people promoted more than anything else, 
is there the they've got the ability to see the strategic bigger picture rather than being concentrated on the little detail now they might think that detail they're charged with is the important bit but if they look bigger than that you have ideas you have suggestions you add value so what is happening in the bigger picture because too many people and i'm going to share my screen again if i may okay too many people look for the little bit and stay in the stay in that little bit okay share that for you all right they stay in one area field of vision and they 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 concentrate on the detail in that field of vision and that's all they tend to look at guys if you want to change if you want to lift that bar if you want to really impress on things, look at the strategic picture. Think strategically about it. Not strategically about how this will help your career, although that can be important, but more strategically how you can see the big picture. I often say to people when I'm coaching, I'll say, will you, will you, will you show them that you have your pulse on what's going on out there in the real world, in the big world? Yeah. So if you're using examples, you can say, so if we're in the retail world, as I know quite a lot of people are, we could say, have you seen that, um, who are the two companies who are potentially going to liquidation? So they will bring you in the liquidators or the receivers, um, two fashion brands, right? If you're in fashion world, you should know about that and what's happening with that and how it could affect it. What are these other things? Jane's nodding away. You know, it's like Jane in the retail world. You have to have your finger on the pulse. Yeah. And it really helps because... If your leader hasn't spotted something, and I've, I've said it before, I don't mind saying it again. There was a BT ad hundreds of years ago, which said, I saw this and I thought of you. If you remember the advert, one or two, you may be a bit too young for that. I remember it well, very cleverly conceived ad. But the principle is still the same. I saw this and thought of you. So I will send books to people. I'll say, I've, I've read this. I think this is really good recommendation for your, for your boss. If they're a reader, if they're a book reader, if not audible or something like that. Um, I've got a lot from this. I thought you might like doing that. Yeah, that's just a way again of persuading them that you're bigger than than they might think you are. I don't mean that in a disparaging way. I just think it's an opportunity to really lift the bar a little bit on that. Okay, so next one on the connection journey: bring your idea to life with a great illustrative story. And for those of you on the call who do similar things to me, we tell people all the time, say, come on, be storytellers. And they say, I can't be a storyteller because it's once upon a time. It's not. We tell stories all the time. I've been telling stories today. Um, in fact, how many people, and please feel free to, to jump in and tell me, what was the example I've just used to illustrate? It's not a test. Please feel free to chip in and say something. Henry the Eighth's armor. Henry the Eighth's armor. Who said that? Wave. <laughs> Thank you, Jake. Jake, you're on. You're on fire today. Uh, Henry the Eighth's armor. That, in straight away in your minds, created a picture. You could see Henry the Eighth in your mind because we were taught it at school. Yeah, and the armor brings it, and then the armor like a Savile Row suit. I, I've been using the story a long time, so I've crafted that a little bit by saying a Savile Row suit also gives you a visual straight away impression of what a saddle row suit's like. So you're giving shortcuts in your stories to whoever you want to persuade and influence. In fact, we could do a thing, we could do an hour on storytelling because I, I love it. So maybe if you're up for it, I'll ask you afterwards, I'll send you an email. Um, if you fancy doing an hour on storytelling, happy to do that and get into depth with it because that might be a bit of fun. Well, it will be a bit of fun. Uh, so if you can bring your idea to life with a great illust illustrative story, um, Someone I was talking to the other day, I said, use props because it makes all the difference. So if you are saying, imagine, yeah, the, and imagine one of my favorite words as well, because it's an instruction as well as an invitation. Imagine that we had lots of bottles for this in the fridge at the moment. It's delightfully chilled water, which has been purified, which has been um, looked after, loving looked, looked after and delivered to you. Is everybody getting thirsty? Yeah, that they are making straight away with the water. That's the effect it has. That's a story. I've just used the prop to illustrate the story, but I've suggested it in your minds. Yeah. Um, the one little thing from radio I would suggest you don't do is if you pour water off screen and all they can hear is um, 
Yeah, that doesn't work either. If you're doing uh, illustrations, you're online, make sure you do it. Because in, in, in radio, the unexpected sound. See, Fiona's drinking. See, it's had that effect, doesn't it? It's like, it's like when someone sort of, um, what's the thing that we, we do? Things, things like when someone yawns. Yeah, if someone yawns, all of us start yawning. Kind of auto-suggestion. Well, this is the same with this. If you have the stories and you create a picture in people's minds, they get it and they're with you. And there's another little uh, slam dunk that goes with this, guys. If you tell your boss a great story, yeah, so you illustrate how a solution can be found in the organization, and we could do this or we could do that, guess what they're going to do with that story? They're going to tell other people because that story they will then repeat because it's such a good story or it's something you've heard outside. Or it's, there's a lovely one this morning. Let me share a story from this morning. It's quite an old story, but I don't know if you've seen it on um, social media about the dog that was lost two years before, the stolen dog. Have you seen that? So the dog was stolen two years before and it reunited with his owner. And this little poor dog was kind of real sort of timid coming forward, wasn't quite sure, stranger, and he sniffed, sniffed again, and suddenly his tail started wagging and he jumped all over this guy two years later. Now, I've told you the story. You can't see a dog. You can't see the owner. But I've connected with you and you've got that straight away, haven't you? And it's doing social media at the moment. At the moment, when we're in this lockdown situation, we look for lovely stories. It's like um, Colonel Tom. Have you all seen Colonel Tom? What a star. What an absolute star who's captured the public's imagination. Yeah and raised five and a half million, maybe six million quid by now, keeps on going up. Absolutely brilliant. Why did that capture the imagination? It's a fantastic story that we can all recognize. Because at the end of the day, it's a lovely old chap walking round and round with his, with his Zimmer frame round his house. We all see that straight away, but this is making such a difference. Okay. So hopefully stories, and maybe next, the next session, we do a storytelling session and we can ship some ideas and things in that. Let me just um, make sure by the way, da, 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 da. I'm just making sure because I've lost it somewhere on my screen. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Yeah, if there's any comments, but I've managed to lose the comment bit. So hopefully if there are any comments, I will come back to it. I'll find it before we, uh, we go again. Right, next thing with your illustrative story, because everyone has a story and don't be afraid to use the prompts and the props. The one thing I would say is collect stories because if you can collect stories as you go through in this lockdown period, we're all kind of talking, sadly, it's all about negatives and deaths and death levels and coronavirus and everything else. But what are the glimmers of story that you could take back when we start again? What are the stories you could take back into the workplace? I said, I saw this while we we're off or, um, I don't know. Wasn't it great? The way we connected through a camera, we can carry on using that. How about we could influence and persuade our consumers using cameras, connecting with people in a different way. Maybe that's something you can take back to, to work when you go. Uh, and how we do these things in a different way, how we can persuade and influence. And we also have something in common because commonality is important for every story. If we have it in common, we have a conversation, right? So what have we all got in common? We've all been through this situation. And that'll be what we all have, in common, all have in common when we go back in. And we can have a conversation about that. And the other thing in common, uh, which I said before, and every conversation you have, please start by saying, I hope you're all well. Yeah, because that's really important. I hope that whatever you're doing and how you're doing, you're keeping safe and well. Because that's authentic and genuine. We need to ask people that more and more and more. So how will you follow up and reinforce the fifth part of the connection journey? Now, there's more stations on this journey but we haven't got time in the short time we're together to talk about them. But how will you follow up and reinforce? The number of people who submit stuff to the boss and says, there we go, or send an email to the boss, and that's it. They wait for the boss to come back. Now, if the boss has had 243 emails that day and yours is one of them, why would you? Or why would they? Right? So why not reinforce it? And maybe not just say, did you get my email? Because that's... How many people who say that to you? Are you on the right back foot or front foot? Did you get my email? Oops, no. Yeah. 
I wonder, I've just thought about this. I saw this and thought of you. Wouldn't that be great if we could do this? Here's an idea which might change our world when we go back to it. All that kind of stuff gets an interest, excites people, brings them into it. Yeah? Do you agree with me? Bit of a nod? How we can change things slightly together? I'm loving that, all these lovely nods. I wish you could all, well, can you all see yourselves? I don't know how many you can see at once. If you're lucky, you can see a, a, a few people. Um, I can see, I can see all of you which is absolutely lovely. Um, and it's, it's nice to sort of uh, see some of those lovely reactions on that. So what am I further? So hopefully those little connection journey ideas might just help a little bit at some stage when you're, um, when you're in the next bit. Um, getting off that hamster wheel. We've been in forced to get off the hamster wheel, haven't we? We've, we've, been, we've had no option apart from to get off the hamster wheel and find other things that are going on in our lives. We've seen things that we never knew were there. Yeah, um, we've seen things that we've, we've done stuff that we wouldn't normally do. Um, my wife is on the call and gardening comes to mind, but I'm not gonna go there because it'll start domestic later on. Um, but we've had chance to get off the hamster wheel. My question to you guys is, when all this is over, right? How much time will you take? Or will you go back into it all hell for leather? Yeah. And, brrr, and straight away go back to the way you were before. Another poll coming up for you. So I'm going to move out of that one. Are we going to get, oh, hang on. I've got some nice questions there from Danny, who's a star man. Yeah, I can't see you, Danny, on that, but I'm sure you're there somewhere. Uh, is it possible a leader can be both facts and figures? Going back a bit, based on the big picture, depending on the time and task. Yeah, let me try that again. Is it possible a leader can be both facts and figures based and big picture based, depending on the time and task? You're totally right, Danny. Yeah, they can. Um, what we have to do is to kind of get used to them and judge which bit they're in. Because there might be a time at certain times of the year when it's all about numbers. It's all about getting the, getting the numbers, getting the facts, getting the detail. And another time of the year might be after the numbers are finished uh, or the, that, that bit's done, then they're thinking of ideas. So then they move more into the creative side. So I'm not saying specifically there are two sorts of people, process people and, and creative people. They're a mix but it's up to us to judge if we want to influence and persuade them which bit they're in at that time. So great questions. Um, and a, a great question from Meredith. The frustration is they're the ones who ask for the pre-reads. Totally true, Mess. The bosses are the ones who ask for the pre-reads in the first place. Question is, do they want the pre-reads to tick a box to say they've got the pre-read or do they want a pre-read that they, because some of them will want it to be on top of it, get that totally, but then everybody gets it and we know some of them don't read it. Yeah, um, and you could, you could, I wasn't going to suggest that, but put something in the pre-read just to see whether they notice what you put in there. Uh, there's a, a lovely story. Years ago when I was doing the radio and telly bit, um, who was it? Who was it I interviewed? It was one of the, one of the cabinet, cabinet um, ministers in, in, in the government. And uh, they were saying the opposition used to put all sorts of, of, of questions. Uh, they knew how a prime minister would answer it. And in the prime minister's book, before they do prime minister's question times, PMQs, they have all the stuff in order from all the submitted questions so they can go to, go to it straight away. And the opposition, they said, we used to love chucking questions in. So we would go to A, then we'd go to Z straight away. Then we go back to C and then we go to P, just purely to give them the, the going through this book because they haven't read all of it and they have to go through it very quickly. Sorry. I digress, but that's part of my fun. I enjoy that. So, poll coming up then, guys. Second poll of the day um, is, and I want you to answer this as you would normally answer it before we've had this forced lockdown, okay? Is that, is that an agreement? Everybody chilled with that. So before we have this forced lockdown, I want you to give me an answer to this, okay? Here we go. How much time a week do you normally spend developing and self-reflecting? I shall merrily have a slip of my coffee. And please be honest. I'll give it another few minutes. If you want to put anything in the uh, in the Zoom chat, please feel free, and don't feel guilty about this. Um,
Okay. Right, give me a couple of seconds more. Okay, let me end the polling on that. <laughs> Sorry, that's no, wrong of me, isn't it, to, to, to sort of laugh in a strange sort of way. Um, what do you think? The, that's really interesting. What do you think the top score was? Anybody fancy chucking a couple of ideas at me? Just unmute your mic and chuck some at me. Which, which one of those do you think scored the most? An hour a week. An hour a week. Wrong. Anybody else? Too busy. Who said that? That's me, Eddie. Oh, Eddie, Eddie, lovely to see yeah. you. Good looking as ever. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, too busy, anybody else? Hmm? Dylan? Five minutes a week. Five minutes a week. Okay. Let me share this poll with you. And, and it is anonymous, um, you'll be pleased to hear, but it's also just an interesting bit of insight into how people think. So there you go, guys. I'm too busy, the winning one. Now, I think some people do every day, self-reflecting. Um, I would like to think I'm one of those, yeah? An hour a day, I think is great if you can, especially in these current times, we've got more time. 30 minutes a day, five minutes a day, at least an hour a week, pretty good. 30 minutes a week, five minutes a week. I'm just too busy. The it's not important for me, um, I don't know who that was. Anybody who doesn't self-reflect never seems to raise the bar. And we talked about raising the bar and your reputation, everything else. If, if it's not important to work on yourself, who's going to? Who's going who's to come over and, and work on you for you? Unless we have any multi-billionaires on the call who have people to do everything for them and they're self-reflecting or leaving me done. They'll outsource their self-reflecting. I don't think any of us are in that case. Uh, it's not important for me. Never. I hope you put that down with a bit of a tongue in cheek because there should be a guilt trip on that. Uh, a, guilt, a guilt trip advisory on that as well um, because it shouldn't be. And I'm just too busy. So thank you for that. Um, let me close that down. Um, it's really interesting, isn't it? If we don't work on ourselves, who's going to do it? And now, if we do nothing else in this lockdown time, what a time to start putting some habits in, the, in, in, in place, to actually spend some time on ourselves, just raise the bar, or even help other people. It's what I'm doing today. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, there's no charge in this, and there's no sell in this, most definitely. I want to help other people to raise their bar. So for me, the gratification would be if in a week's time you drop me an email and say, hey, John, I've done this differently. I would love that. I really would, because that is kind of making a difference. And it's not, and this world, I sincerely hope when things go back to normal, that we're in a better place for helping other people. Yeah, being less selfish. Because you look at some of the selfish people who've been out there and you think, that's not important. They're selfish about stuff that isn't important. What is important is about supporting other people. Whether it's going out and on Thursday nights and clapping the NHS or just saying thank you for your service to people in the NHS, which I don't know where you have been doing more of. Just saying thank you. Even someone was tapping the bin men, I, I saw on telly this morning. Everything helps, every little bit helps. So if we can change that. So I'm gonna zip through this. If anybody has to go at three, I might run over a little bit. Is everybody up for that? Yeah, or, or have you got plans to do lots of other stuff? <laughs> mm, okay, so let me um, share my screen with you and talk about this little art of self-reflection. I'll apologize to anybody from Scotland who's on the call. Oh, what's some power of the gifty gears to see. As you request, I'll keep things quiet when you're full screen. No, oh, thank you so much. Um, I, oh, what a, oh, what some power the gifty gears to see ourselves as others see us. It's Robert Burns, for those of you who are into that kind of thing. But it does make a difference because we don't often get a chance to see how other people see us or even think about how other people see us, apart from when we do things like this. So the art of self-reflection, take some time out, please. All right, promise me. Take some time out. Even if it's five minutes a day, a couple of minutes a day, think, how can I add value here? How can I bring something to the party which, which is exciting and fun? 
So, a couple of quick questions that people sort of sent me last week, and I, I promised to, to, to um, touch on briefly. How do I deal with difficult bosses? Now, I know none of you have difficult bosses, but someone's asked me that, so I will answer the question. Difficult bosses, yeah, the first thing is to really understand why they're being difficult. Is it a natural inbuilt thing? Maybe it is, that's difficult to deal with. If it's they're under pressure, do we understand they're under pressure? Or are we just saying they should be great? Because all bosses are expected to be fantastic at all times. Maybe they've got some personal pressure. Maybe they've got some financial pressure. Maybe they've got some mental pressure. You know, try and understand them a little bit better. There's a word I use called pedestalization, which you may, uh, I may have introduced to you before, which is when we put things and situations on a pedestal. Meatloaf taught me it. I won't tell you the long story, but he, I interviewed him and he was so far up there, I went in and uh, dried up. I haven't done it since in my career, but I did then because I couldn't think of another question to ask him until he said, what else do you want to know, John? I couldn't think of another question to ask him. But I put him on a pedestal and push myself down. Same with bosses and difficult bosses. We can put them on a pedestal so we don't talk to them as normal people and be helpful and supportive as normal people. We stick them up there and we push ourselves down. So beware of pedestalization. What about the nerves and the self-doubts? Well, my small suggestion in the short time we've got together, and this is something else we could spend time on, if you'd like to. Um, how do we deal with nerves? How do we deal with the what ifs? Well, what if I say that? What if I do that? What if it? That's our brain playing tricks with us to self protect us. So we bring up all these things that get in the way of being who we are by, ooh, what if this? What if that? What if the other? My brief, because we haven't time, my brief thought on that is we can change things when we know we're doing it. If we're being reactive to it and letting those happen, right, and just accepting that as normal and natural, and I'm gonna think that anyway, well, we are, but we, at least if we bring it into our conscious thought, we can do something about it and realize we're actually doing it, yeah? There's a, there's a technique which you may have, uh, be where I think people probably know as well, name the brain, which is you call your brain something. So I call mine Brian, because I found it funny. And if I'm having one of those what if moments, I'll say, oh, come on, Brian, shut up. I make a different person. And it's my brain doing that to me so I can become more logical again. Yeah, and sensible uh, and, and deal with the nerves. Um, it's a bit weird. And I shared this before. I'm a shy person in a noisy body. But give me 50,000 people on a microphone. I'm actually very comfortable there. Yeah, because I've kind of, I bring it to my conscious. I think about what I want from it. I, I think about what the outcome could be. And I push all the fears down a little bit to be able to cope with that. And I'm not going to get rid of them. Always be nervous. But actually being able to control those nerves. We should do a session on that because there's a, a lot of it. Now, the other thing I'd say is always choose your mindset. I know I say this a lot, but I mean it. If we have the right mindset, when we get up in the morning, the day is a lot better. If we're in the place before we go in front of a big meeting or before we go in front of our bosses, which we're talking about today, choose your mindset before you walk in the room. Okay? Choose the way you want to be. Not react to it and go in and think, oh, because if you're on the back foot, right? How? Hang on. I'm going to get the chat room up. Someone's asked me a question. Yeah. If you're on the, if you're, oh, thanks, Victoria. Love to see you. And Rachel's got to go, but thank you. Um, if you're on the back foot, yeah, then you're always going to be on the back foot throughout that conversation. If you've chosen your mindset, well, I'll be on the front foot in this conversation. I'm bringing some good stuff to the party and I'm going to look forward to being there and I want to share my ideas with them. You're in a much better place. So why not choose the mindset in the first place? Now, I have another couple of things which I don't want to dwell on too much today. One of them um, is a little technique. Would you like a little technique for our lockdown to make us feel that little bit better about ourselves? Is that all right, Carol? Yeah, you're still tucked around the corner. Yeah, lovely. <laughs> okay, right. Are we ready? Get yourself comfortable. Tony's disappeared, but I can see his dog. Yeah, okay. So get yourself comfortable, guys. And this is my little mental boxing. Now, no one's driving, hopefully. Um, if you are driving and listen to this, I do, please go away and think about something different. However, right, what I want you to do is get comfortable in your seat, sort of get your feet on the floor, right? Either put your hands on your knees or your hands on your desk if you're trying to do it and straighten your back, okay? And get comfortable, right? 
I want to do a little bit of um, mind relaxation. It's a little technique I use. So if you're going to see the boss and you're getting stressed, or if you're walking on stage, which is where I use it the most, if you're feeling, Whoa! or if you're feeling anxious about a situation, if you're anxious about what's going on at the moment around us, which is doom and gloom, try this little thing. So close your eyes, if you would. And interestingly, I can tell the ones who trust me because they didn't close their eyes, Jake. Uh, so, right, you, thanks. <laughs> right, close your eyes. All right. Now, what I want you to imagine is there's a beautiful wooden box in front of you. And this wooden box has got a lovely in there. You choose the pattern, you choose the color, it's entirely yours. And there's a wooden box there. Now, open the lid in your mind, and inside the lid, you'll see a beautiful inlaid velvet interior you choose whatever your favorite color is for your inlaid interior okay and so make sure you get this velvet box the the, the, the wooden box with the velvet interior with the lovely color you like now this is the fun bit close your eyes jane this is the fun bit okay take a favorite place a picture of your favorite place in your mind yeah, it could be the seaside, it could be a lovely walk in the countryside, it could be a friend's house, it, whatever. Take a picture of that favourite place and mentally put it in your little box. Okay? Give me a nod if you got that, gently. Thank you. Now, secondly, a favourite smell, which could be freshly baked bread. It could be a favourite perfume or aftershave. It could be um, grass, mown grass. It could be the countryside. Anything you like, take that and put that in your mental box too. Now take a favourite taste. Okay. What's your favourite? It might be a favourite food. It might be a favourite drink. It could be some caramel vodka. <clears throat> no, it's getting too personal. Uh, it could be anything you like. Take your favourite drink and pop it into the wooden box. Okay, with it. So we've got a favourite place a favorite taste and take a favorite sound okay it could be a friend talking with child sort of talking to you it could be um i don't know any sound you like piece of music you really like whatever and put that in the box too so we've got a favorite place favorite taste favorite smell favorite sound okay and finally, a favorite feeling. And that feeling could be walking down a beach somewhere with the sea just whipping around your toes or the sand around your toes. This is really cruel, I realize, at this time when we're all locked down. But, you know, that's the idea. Somewhere that you really like to be at and the feeling you get. It could be dangling your hand over a, a boat in a river as you're going down there. Right. So take that favorite feeling, those five things, and now mentally close the lid on the box put the box back into your mind and gently open your eyes again and come back to join me. Okay. Do you feel more relaxed after that? Because what we did, we went to somewhere that you felt better in and loads of stuff that reminded you about great stuff that you like. And strangely, I find that huge. I, I, I find it relaxing doing it, but hopefully you found it relaxing too. So if you're a bit stressed, yeah, in fact, is everybody still awake? Yeah, no one nodded during that, did they? Okay. Uh, I have been told my voice can be a bit soporific at times. Uh, but if, if, honestly, if you're stressed, if it's, everything's getting a bit too much, or you're about to go and see your boss and you're feeling about that, open the mental box first. Because the person that's looking back at me now, guys, is really you. Yeah. Danny just says, start a career in meditation. I don't think so, Sam. <laughs> but thank you. Anyway. So relaxing on the mindset. Let me finally go through this last couple of slides for you. Okay. So have that mindset relaxation. Yeah. Do stuff with your brain to make you think the way you want to be. Um, I'm going to share this to next time. Uh, and it's a story of a guy called Bo Eason, who's an NFL player. Uh, but it's a technique for when you walk into a room, how to own it. I'll make a note. I promise you'll do that in the next session we do. And um, be authentic is something I suggested earlier, because you are the most important person. Yeah, the more authentic you can be, the more the real you you can be, the more value you bring to it. And don't get the barriers in the way about saying, oh, I'm not worthy. 
yeah, I'm not good enough. There's something called false imposter syndrome, which you know, in all, they pay me all this money, but they don't know I'm crap, you know? Don't get that in the way. These are all what ifs that kind of get in there. And the other thought from today to leave you with is don't just park some of the suggestions we've talked about. Do something about them. Because it's easier just to move on and think, oh, that was all right. I'll move on. Now I'll go and do something else. We're all just as guilty as that. How do you keep it awake all the time? With my clients, I give them a little book. And I say, that's your me book. And some people may have one. Just write them in. Write ideas in. Write stories in. We'll talk about stories next time, I promise you. Write stories in. Write ideas in. Uh, and, and have fun with it. Guys, I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, I've gone over by 10 minutes, which is totally wrong of me. Uh, and apologies. I will drop you an email, uh, if that's all right with you, and say, what do you enjoy about it? What would you like about it? Is there anything you'd like me to talk about further? If you are, if you are up for, um, I'm opening the, where are we in the chat room? If there's anything on the chat. Um, thanks, thanks, Mez, I'm a radiator. Yeah, I, oh, it's lovely to see you. And re, there's, a, there's loads of stories I could tell about Mez, but I won't at this stage, but I might next time. How's that for a threat? Uh, but it's been, look, thanks, Trish. Uh, and, Everyone, thank you. Thank you. No, it's been great fun. Thank you for joining me. Uh, if you'd like to do another one of these next week, probably Wednesday-ish, uh, I'll drop you an email after this session. Just reply, let me know. Let me know what resonated with you. And for anybody who I've coached, you'll know my favourite question is, what resonated most? Because that's a way of finding out what people are thinking. And say that to your bosses too. What's resonating with you about that? Because it makes them stop and think, and you get some instant feedback from that too. Uh, LinkedIn, Twitter or online, well, you know where I am, and most people think I've got my mobile number and everything else. So you're very, very welcome to this, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Tell all your friends, because the more people we have on, the more fun we can have. Mm -hmm.